Luther Baldwin was just a little drunk in July 1798 when he watched President John Adams and his wife Abigail process with great fanfare through the streets of Newark, New Jersey. When 16 cannons were fired to honor the president, Baldwin shouted something to the effect that, I hope they hit the president in the ass. His friends thought he was hilarious. But federal officials, they were not amused. They later arrested Baldwin and charged him with violating the recently passed Sedition Act. Yeah, 1790s. Those were contentious times. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... So huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 28 in which we dive into the tumultuous and critically important years of the 1790s, a time when the very fate of the New Republic hung in the balance. We are coming to you this week from the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, where my handle is inthepastlane. Making sure this whole operation runs smoothly is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Hey, Lulu, I think there's something wrong with these headphones. I I just simply can't hear anything. Dude, your headphones are not plugged in. Righty. That would explain... Yeah, that would explain the silence. Anyway. Okay, we're good. Anywho, we have another terrific episode for you this week. Here's the lineup. First, I'll do a short setup segment on the really perilous political scene in the United States in the 1790s. Second, I'll sit down with historian Carol Birkin to talk about her new book, A Sovereign People, The Crisis of the 1790s and the Birth of American Nationalism. It's a fun and deeply interesting conversation that I think you're going to love. Okay, people, keep an eye out for corrupt French officials demanding bribes. Your journey in the past lane begins now. We live in an age of fractious and ugly politics, do we not? Incessant political rancor, outrageous accusations, fear-mongering, fake news and scandals, zero bipartisanship. Yeah, fractious and ugly, to say the least. But here's a thought that might ease your anxiety just a bit. This is hardly the first time the United States has been beset by political warfare. In fact, that was the situation in the first decade of the Republic's existence, the 1790s. And in many ways, this tumultuous political scene was far more dangerous 230 years ago because the new nation was so very weak and vulnerable. Weak and vulnerable? The mighty USA was once weak and vulnerable? Yes, indeed. So, to really understand the 1790s, we need to get past the mythical aura surrounding the age of the founders. Oftentimes, when we look back at the founding period, we imagine a Mount Olympus-like setting where near godlike figures with Names like Washington, Franklin, Jefferson, Hamilton needed only a few meetings and a few documents to fashion a stable and enduring republic. I sometimes call this the marble period in American history, because in our imaginations, we often see the people who established the republic as the marble statues that decorate the nation's public spaces today. We see these marble men as perfect, without the normal human fallibilities like jealousy, self-interest, pettiness, and greed. When we think of Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, Madison, and the rest in this manner, we are not only deluding ourselves, we're cheating ourselves out of the excitement and fun that is the messiness of history. History properly understood is always messy, and no era in American history was messier and arguably more dangerous than the 1790s. So what was going on? Well, here are the main challenges facing the young republic. 
To begin with, the New Republic was tiny, poor, and highly vulnerable to the great European powers like England and France. And to make matters worse, in 1793, England and France went to war. Now, the U.S. declared itself neutral in the conflict, but it soon found itself caught up in the struggle between these two great powers. A second challenge at this time was that political parties began to form. And as they did, partisan rancor and discord exploded. Federalists, led by people like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, dominated the government. But a new party soon emerged to challenge the Federalists, the Democratic Republicans that were eventually led by Thomas Jefferson. And politics soon got really ugly. I mean, really ugly. Some of the more contentious issues were the Whiskey Rebellion, which was a revolt against a tax on whiskey. There was also the Genet Affair and the XYZ Affair, And these were two diplomatic crises involving U.S. relations with France. And the Alien and Sedition Acts. These were unpopular laws that restricted immigration and basically criminalized any free speech that criticized the federal government or federal officials. Historians have long discussed these controversies as crises that ultimately doomed the Federalist Party. But Carol Birkin, a renowned historian with whom I'll speak in a minute, has just published a new book that challenges this view. The real story of the crisis of the 1790s, says Birkin, is the way that these four crises all contributed to the formation of American national identity. Remember, the U.S. at this time is a new and fragile nation, made up of people who more often than not identified with their states rather than their nation. So while these crises were divisive and controversial, they also led more and more Americans to see themselves as Americans and to defend national institutions like the presidency and the Constitution. Don't go anywhere, people. In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. All right, Edward T. O'Donnell here at In the Past Lane, and with me now is historian Carol Birkin. Carol Birkin is Presidential Professor of History at Baruch College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She is a scholar of the American Revolution and the founding period and of the role women have played in U.S. history. Carol is the author of many books, including Revolutionary Mothers, Women and the Struggle for American Independence, and A Brilliant Solution, Inventing the American Constitution. Her most recent book, and the one we are eager to speak with her about today, is A Sovereign People the crises of the 1790s, and the birth of American nationalism. Carol Birkin, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Well, I'd like to start off with some context, because in some ways this era seems so far ago, so long ago. And you begin by pointing out something very important. You start with George Washington's inaugural address of 1789, and you note that while Washington and his fellow Federalists like Alexander Hamilton are really confident that they've created a, an ideal constitution and an, an ideal federal government, they're also really nervous. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety about the fragility of, to use their word, this experiment, mm-hmm. and fear about its chances. So maybe you could tell our listeners, what is it about Republican government in the eyes of people like Washington and its fragility, and also the wider context in which this new nation, nothing is guaranteed in this era, even though we think of the founding era as being some sort of divinely ordained moment. Right. Well, for one thing, I don't think they thought they created a perfect document. They were content with the idea that they had done their best to save the country from disappearing. And they were truly afraid of that. That is, they thought that there would be multiple internal wars between competing states that had longstanding rivalries or that they would be nibbled away at on their borders by the real powerful countries in the Western world, that is France, Holland, England, whereas they were really a sort of upstart 
it's very hard for my students ever to grasp the idea that America was not the most powerful country in the world forever. Right. I had a student once who wrote, From the minute pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, America was the most important country in the world. (laughs) I hope he's not trying to sail anytime too soon if he's landing on the rock. That's right. And we can appreciate his optimism and his enthusiasm, but not necessarily his accuracy. (laughs) Right. So I think that they really thought that America was in crisis. We can, looking back, argue, oh, no, it really wasn't. Everything would have been fine. But that's called Monday morning quarterbacking. Right. And I think that they were extremely fearful that there were other Americans, many of them heroic revolutionaries, leaders of the revolutionary movement like Patrick Henry or Samuel Adams, who felt this government was far more dangerous than anything else because they were extremely fearful of replacing the British central government that was distant and in their minds abusive with a new central government that had every potential as far as someone like Patrick Henry was concerned to be equally tyrannical and abusive. And so I think that men like Hamilton and Washington, who believed they had really done their best, They were not overly confident that, in fact, the government would take, you know, that that it would grab hold, that people would even acknowledge it, that they would not simply go on their way thinking the state government was their real government and Mm -hmm. who cared about this federal government. So I think they had every reason to be anxious. They had not gotten an overwhelming, we would call it today, mandate for ratifying the Constitution. In some cases, they had to cancel, suddenly abort a a ratifying convention because they thought they were pretty sure they didn't have the votes. They had pulled a few of what we would call today dirty tricks or pressuring to get it ratified. And they knew that throughout every state, there was still powerful and important men and ordinary men who were extremely hostile to the idea of creating any powerful government that was not located right where they lived in their state. So when Washington gives his inaugural statement, he's not being paranoid or he's not being pessimistic when when he says that they hope to goodness that people will accept this government. That's the best that they can do. Right. So you can't establish the new government simply by writing this document. It, it has to be earned in a way. The nation, it has to be earned. Exactly. The structure of your book is really interesting because it takes up four events that I think everybody remembers from their early days in high school. And, you know, everybody has an index card somewhere in their basement with these four events on it. <laughs> And you have said that, you know, often when we look at these four events, which I'll detail in just a moment, that we think of them as their problems, that the Federalists are plagued by these problems and that they lead to the emergence of their rivals Mm -hmm. as a result. And I think your take is quite different on that. So let's just go quickly through them. The first event is the Whiskey Rebellion. The second is the Genet Affair. The third is the XYZ Affair. And the fourth is the Alien and Sedition Acts. And these all happen in the 1790s. Right. I think, for one thing, the opposition party in embryo among anti-federalists and states' rights people was there from, as people at home, my home state of Alabama would say, from the get-go. Right. But I think what historians often have focused on is the role these events played in the emergence of the Republican Party that challenged the Federalists party and ended up with Jefferson being elected in 1801. That is, they're seen through the prism of the emergence of the first party system. And I had really two purposes in writing this book. The first was to give the Federalists their due, because I honestly believe that for better or for worse, and often making terrible mistakes, they shepherded the country through its absolutely critical first 10 years. But secondly, as I looked at these crises, I thought one of the things you could see was the emergence 
of exactly what was necessary, which was a growing identification with being a nation rather than a Marylander and a Virginian and a Massachusetts man and a Connecticut man. That is a growing sort of national identity. And with that came a validation of this federal government. And so today, American nationalism, people get really antsy about that phrase. Oh, does that mean white people only? Or, oh, does that mean going to war for your nation, right or wrong? That's not the kind of nationalism that was essential in the 1790s. What was essential was for people to begin to say, yes, I'm an American, and yes, this government represents me, and I support it. And I think that by the end of the 1790s, you see that. Certainly, you see that even the opponents of the Federalists acknowledge that the Constitution is the law of the land. And that's, that's an incredible achievement, I think. Right. So I, I wanted to give the Federalists there a tip of my hat. I think you're right on there when saying that it is a remarkable accomplishment. In some ways, by 1801, they, they lose power. But by 1801, they have gained a country or created exactly. a country beyond just the idea of the United States that is, in fact, taking hold. A nation isn't really a thing. It's an idea. And it's exactly. really become an idea that is beginning to supersede state identities. Not completely, but substantially. No, never, never completely. The dilemma of federalism, Alexander Hamilton, of course, as usual, was absolutely right. He said, federalism will never work. You can't share sovereignty. And of course, it has never been resolved from the Hartford Convention, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, the nullification controversy, the Civil War. Yep. There's always that tension between the authority of the federal government and the authority of the state governments. But finally, by 1800, the authority of the federal government was acknowledged, and that's the victory that I was trying to get to. All right. Well, let's back up from that sort of victory point or, or achievement point to say how it was done and maybe begin with the Whiskey Rebellion. That's the first crisis that you, you take on. And that basically, the outlines are it's 1792 to 1794. And what has happened is the cash-strapped federal government uh, and the Treasury Department, headed by Hamilton, has imposed a tax on distilled spirits, mostly whiskey which is the principal way in which a lot of Western farmers earn some hard currency. So they are furious about this uh, this tax, and they basically say, we're not going to pay it. We're not going to pay this federal tax. It's more than just we're not going to pay it. It's who the heck are they? Right. I'm, gonna, I'm just ignoring this. The focus of many people about the Whiskey Rebellion is on Western Pennsylvania. But the real <laughs> mm. scary opponents are the people of Kentucky and some of the western counties of Virginia because they just ignore it. They don't even bother to register a complaint about mm -hmm. the whiskey tax. They just say, we're not paying any attention to this. Their government attorneys won't bring anyone to court. Nobody will enforce the whiskey tax. Nobody even talks about it. And in many ways, this is the sort of ultimate terror that the Federalists face that people will just say, you know, no, I'm not paying any attention to you. At least the Western Pennsylvania guys arm themselves and start engaging in intimidation and violence against the government's agents. At least they're responding to it. And I think that the issue for the Federalists, that is for the government, the issue wasn't whether the whiskey tax would be paid. The issue was, as Hamilton pointed out, if the Congress passes a law and it is not enforced, it can't be enforced, then no law ever will be enforced. Right. This was the litmus test. Either this government has authority or it doesn't. And that that happens very early on in Washington's first administration. And it's really, frankly, a crisis, a for real crisis. And it's a complicated crisis because the federal government needs to assert its authority. But as you point out, it needs to do it in a very particular way because it knows that generally speaking, Americans and particularly Western farmers are afraid of external or distant 
authority being brought down upon them. So Washington has to assert federal authority, but not in a way that seems tyrannical. Exactly. Washington and Hamilton have this exchange that just encapsulates both their strengths and weaknesses. Hamilton, you know, when he decides something's right, he just wants to go ahead and do it. Full on. He does, he, there's no, there are no soft edges to anything. And so he says to Washington, we've got to march in with an army right away and we've got to make these people pay this tax. And in a sense, he was strategically, militarily correct. That is, the faster you act, the quicker you'll be able to put down the rebellion, the less time they'll have to organize. But Washington has diplomacy. Washington says, you know what? People are afraid this government is going to be tyrannical. If we go marching in with an army, what message will that send? We have to try every possible legal and judicial means and be able to say to the people of America, we tried everything. This is our last resort. And of course, Washington was right. So how does he do it? How do they, they do respond militarily, but what's the sort of, you know, multiple way in which they approach it, where they're both authoritative and assertive of federal power, but also not going to come across as a tyrannical iron fist? Exactly. Well, first of all, some people have romanticized these risky rebels. Oh, the noble farmers of the frontier being oppressed. They weren't being oppressed. Right. I mean, I think that argument comes out of people who were members of the Whiskey Rebellion who quickly ran out and wrote their version of the story. They were intimidating and violently harming anybody who favored the whiskey tax, who tried to pay the whiskey tax, or who was trying to collect the whiskey tax. So Washington and the administration tries several things. They try first finding local attorney generals or you know, state officials who will arrest these people and bring them to trial. They try a commission to go meet with these uh, whiskey rebels and try to hammer out some kind of an agreement. And what's really, I think what shows how concerned they were not to seem tyrannical is that they always offered amnesty. If you will just agree in the future to pay the law, you don't even have to pay your back taxes. If you'll just agree to stop beating up revenue collectors, we will forgive all your past sins or past behavior. And when they did go in with the military, those militia, because it was militias men from Pennsylvania and from surrounding states, it was not a federal army. When they did go in, they were under the strict orders not to abuse their military power. And in fact, nobody was shot, nobody was wounded, nobody was killed. And, and there was amnesty granted for everyone, even the people who were the ringleaders who were arrested for violent crimes. Washington pardons them all. Yeah, making a strategic choice there, that that's the better action in terms of, in terms of optics. Exactly. And the first thing Washington does is goes to Congress. It was not in session when they make this decision to bring in the military. And he says, I did this under the duress of the moment, but I'm not the legislator. You are. You have got to pass legislation that approves of my actions and that makes a statement about the need for peaceful acceptance of laws passed by Congress. So this is a very careful effort where the goal is to enforce the idea that Congress's laws must be obeyed, not to terrorize anybody. Right. And so that's the first big challenge, the big challenge to the legitimacy of federal authority, congressional legislation. The second incident happens roughly at the same time, and it's the Genet Affair, and it's named for Edmund Charles Genet, who is a French envoy or whatever his particular title is. And he arrives in the U.S. in 1793 and begins immediately to make some pretty serious demands that ultimately, you know, when it boils down to this threat is different from the first one. This one is a threat to U.S. sovereignty. Exactly. Vis-a-vis -vis France. 
So he demands, you know, the U.S. essentially openly side with France in its war against Great Britain, right down to opening up American ports to uh, French ships, and really tries to sort of bully the U.S. into siding with France. Exactly. You know, given today the concern about Russia's influence, I'm just tempted to write an op-ed that says, you know, this is not the first time. Mm -hmm. Genet himself was simply an an idiot diplomat. I mean, he really had no idea. These men are very young, mm -hmm. 27 years old. He, What he lacks in diplomacy, he makes up for in zeal yep. and pompous behavior. But he represents the reality of the fact that both Britain and France viewed America as a potential satellite of their country. They did not take seriously the idea of, of an independent United States. I don't mean that Britain wanted to have them back as colonies, but rather the idea that America could set its own foreign policy. They both, throughout this entire period and up through the War of 1812, viewed America as a pawn in the great struggle that was going on, which was between the two great powers, Britain and France. And England is in many ways no better, but they're just more diplomatic and more clever about it. They have better manners. Yes, they have much better manners. It's, it's just striking. Genet comes in, and it's more than that he ignores American law. The man tries to recruit, organizes the recruitment of Americans to fight in the French army to reseize the Louisiana territory. He brings French prize ships, that is, that privateers have captured from the English on the high seas. He brings them into American ports. And instead of having the American admiralty courts make a judgment, he sets up his own French admiralty court in Charleston, in Boston, right. in Philadelphia. It's extraordinary that in his mind, America really... It's just a place that the French are engaging in their war with England. And Jefferson, who very much supports the French Revolution, Hamilton, who recognizes, I think, very early on that it's not like the American Revolution, that it is going to end in chaos and anarchy and oppression. They're at odds about who to side with in this conflict in Europe. But even Jefferson ultimately comes to see, because he supports Genet for quite a while, even he finally writes to Madison. He says, you know, I tried, I tried to explain to this man that he's doing everything wrong. I tried to tell him that he can't ignore American sovereignty. I wash my hands of him now. Yeah. But from the very beginning, Hamilton said, this man is an insult to our sovereignty. We have got to get rid of him. And ultimately, of course, they do. He only lasts less than a year, wreaking havoc <laughs> everywhere right. he goes. The ultimate bull in a china shop. Yes. The problem was that France was very popular with the average American voter because they had supported the Americans in their war. And the Americans were in love with the idea that representative government now had a Spot in Europe. I mean, that really gave you an ally somewhere. And so everywhere Genet went, he had great crowds cheering him on. And it took many months and many, many infractions of American sovereignty for people to finally say, wait a minute. And that was when Washington is struck. That is, that's when he wrote to the French government and he said, you've got to recall this man. And unfortunately for Genet, the French government was changing hands pretty rapidly. And by the time right. by the time they called for his recall, the people in France were declaring Genet a traitor. Yeah. <laughs> and then Washington does this amazing thing. After all the trouble Genet has caused, he refuses to he gives sanctuary to Genet because he knows if he's sent back to France, he'll be guillotined. And Genet lives in upstate New York, and he marries Governor Clinton's daughter, and he becomes an American citizen. Yep. Well, Washington is not really a vindictive leader. 
No, he seems to have this ability, this uncanny ability to thread the needle. Yeah. You know, to essentially rebuff these intrusions and to assert U.S. neutrality and sovereignty, but also do it in a way that doesn't alienate all the Americans who really do like exactly. Genet and the French. And so he comes out looking good. And as you point out, he comes out not only, you know, there's tremendous adoration for George Washington as sort of the embodiment of the revolution, but you make the point that actually some of that affection or some of that uh, devotion rubs off on the office yes. by the time this affair is over, that it's not just a hero worship, it's now become trust in the office of the presidency, which, exactly. which I think is a really, really important part of this nation building idea you're talking about. Exactly. What you see with each of these crises is a kind of shift from personality to institution. That is the original reason people generally support Washington about the Whiskey Rebellion is it's Washington. By the time you get to Genet, the support is not just for Washington, but for the idea that the president and his government are the defenders of American independence. And you're going to see after every one of these crises, a new identification, not with an individual man, not with an individual office, but with the government and the constitution that created it as a whole. And Washington, Washington husbands this transformation through. There's a very fancy term for it from Smeltzer. He says the routinization of charisma. Mm -hmm. That is the way in which you transfer this individual charisma into respect for the office itself. And you certainly see it by the end of the Genet affair. Indeed. And the next incident is the XYZ affair, and that comes that falls into the lap of Washington's successor, John Adams. Yes. And again, it's a product of this basically a, a world war or the European right. or Atlantic war that's still raging and the U.S. is trying to stay out of it. And so the U.S. has a treaty, the John Jay Treaty or the Jay Treaty, that basically established neutrality with Great Britain. So that's an important way of staying out. And Adams wants a similar kind of treaty with France to sort of solve this problem of you know, potentially being dragged into the war. And say he sends some envoys over to France to see if they can negotiate some sort of treaty. And they are met with demands for bribes and also a demand that the U.S. government make a loan to France to help its its financing of its war against Great right. Britain. So this is a, another international or, you know, diplomatic crisis. And this all becomes public. And Adams faces a really big dilemma. Yes. Adams lacks <laughs> the finesse that Washington had. And he sends Adams is not really the head of his party. Hamilton is. And Adams resents this terribly. Very few people rally around him. And he, for some reason that is really inexplicable, he does not appoint members of his cabinet who are loyal to him. Mm. He keeps on members of the cabinet who are loyal to Hamilton. It's so, you'll forgive me, so stupid that you begin to wonder. And he appoints these three babes in the woods when it comes to diplomacy. He appoints three men who have no experience whatsoever in diplomacy to go engage with the wiliest, mm -hmm. <laughs> most immoral, that is, unethical, sophisticated French negotiators. And one of them is one of his best friends. He has very few friends. This is one of them who is absolutely the most unpopular man ever to have been in Congress. People hate him. He can't get along with anybody. And of course, these three men go over and within months, it's two against one and one who's, you know, sabotaging everything. And they absolutely get pulled by the nose by Talleyrand. It's embarrassing to read how Many mistakes they make. They agree to negotiate with people who aren't really in the government, with mm -hmm. intermediaries. They never actually, till the very end of the time they're there, get to sit down with Talleyrand. And the demand that they pay a bribe is just the French way of doing business. The French demand that of everybody. But the right. Americans are naive. They think this is a terrible insult and it's immoral and they're offended beyond belief. And when he makes the demand for a forced loan, it's obvious that that will mean that America will be at war with, with England. 
And so they come home with their tails between their legs. And out of this, it's not that John Adams handles this well. He absolutely does not. From beginning to end, this is, this is on him. He gets us into a quasi-war with France. He doesn't ever actually declare war. He raises money for the military. Hamilton takes over the army. But what comes out of it, nevertheless, is that the average American citizen feels offended that their, their sovereign government has been insulted. They identify now not just with the office of the president, but they identify with the federal government and its serving as the representative of America to the rest of the world. And that's, you know, in a sense, that's victory out of the jaws of defeat. Right. That, that outrage that they felt as Americans, as opposed to Virginians and, and New Yorkers. Exactly. Was, was feeding into a third stream that feeds into that emerging nationhood or notion of nationhood that you've been talking about. Exactly. And kind of encapsulated in that famous quotation, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. Exactly. By that, you know, the, the line referring to national defense, not state defense. And also tribute is what, you know, vassal states pay to, to their overlords. And exactly. we're not, we, the whole people are not going to permit that. Exactly. When a Virginia Republican says, we are all Americans today, then you can see really clearly how important this terrible disaster in diplomacy proved to be. So that leaves us with a fourth incident. And you, know, you point out that these events happened in the 1790s, but they really happened all of them, all four of them in about six years. Yes. So it's a really intense period of overlapping crises. And this one is the Alien and Sedition Acts, which because of recent events and questions about immigration and our borders and yes. excluding certain peoples has received more attention. So maybe it's one of the more familiar bygone events. But in 1798, the, the Federalists seek to crack down on dissent within the country and along the way to also hurt the emerging Jeffersonian Republicans. So they, they place curbs on free speech, especially the freedom of the press, and a number of editors get thrown in jail. And they also put limits on immigration and naturalization as a way to kind of put the hurt on what they see as their natural political enemies. And so the biggest outcome of that is, is the resistance that comes right. to it, which is in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolution. So maybe you could tell us what the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions essentially were and what was at stake right. in the assertions that are in the center of those. Right. Well, for one thing, I think where I'm going to shock other historians with my interpretation is I really don't see in the Alien and Sedition Acts any actual oppression. I realize that in theory there could have been, but of course Adams never enforced any of the Alien Acts. He didn't enforce the Alien Enemies Act. He didn't enforce the Alien Friends Act. The Alien Friends Act just dies in 1800, and the Alien Enemies Act isn't really used until the 20th century in America. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the newspapers, and I laugh today when people say, oh, you know, fake news and the newspapers are irresponsible. The newspapers in the 18th century, the lies, the slanders, the slurs, the, mm -hmm. the attacks based on absolutely no evidence at all. And the poor... President Adams is just, it's like steamroller after steamroller over him. He's accused of everything from being overweight to being insane. And a monarchist. Yes, a monarchist, all kinds of things. So you can imagine that as they are riding high after the XYZ affair in popularity, the impulse, I'm not justifying it, but the impulse to silence these Republican newspapers to get a little relief from them. But in the long run, the Federalists are defenders of the legal process and of the justice system. And very few people are convicted. Very few people, very few newspaper editors, I can count them on one and a half hands, are ever put in jail. And the irony of this is that from jail, they continue to write. They're not prevented from continuing 
to write these scandalous statements from their jail cell and have them published. So the whole, the whole suppression of the press is a dud. It really is unsuccessful. You can argue that it was still a matter of principle to oppose it, but a totalitarian state it was not. Right. But what Jefferson and Madison do is take advantage. They're smart enough to see that they've got a great issue here. And Jefferson prods Madison, you've got to write something, you've got to write something. And they pen for Virginia and Kentucky two sets of resolutions, though they do it anonymously and nobody's supposed to know that they are the original authors of these documents, that challenge the alien and sedition laws and challenge the Federalist government on the grounds that what they are doing is unconstitutional, which has the effect of essentially turning the Republican Party into a defender of the Constitution that the Federalists produced. From that point on, there will be arguments about what does the Constitution allow, what does the Constitution say. But there will never be an argument again until the Civil War where anybody says the Constitution is not the valid framework for a government of this country. And that's a a major, major turning point. The danger of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions is that they flirt with the idea of secession or nullification. Right. Saying essentially that states have the right to nullify any law that they deem unconstitutional or unjust. If you read the Confederacy statements in the 1860s, you will hear the language of Jefferson and Madison, which goes a little like this. The states created the Constitution, created the federal government, not the people. The people didn't create it. The states created it. And therefore, the states can have a final say in whether they will accept a law or not. And if this isn't accepted by the government, we have a right not just to nullify that law, but to withdraw from the union. And that's, I think, going to come to haunt them in the 19th century. That is the first statement, really, of the principle of nullification. So in pressing that argument, which is the ultimate states' right argument, you can presage the Civil War. Yeah, it definitely seems like the blueprint and the ability of the Federalist Party to reject that argument. And as you say, have both sides essentially arguing about constitutionality is in a way an, an affirmation of the legitimacy of the Constitution. Absolutely. I think that's the final victory The final contribution that the Federalists really make is that from then on, arguments are going to be not over, as the anti-Federalists said, and as the anti-administration people said in the early 1790s, the Constitution isn't a legitimate government. Now it's going to be, how do we interpret the Constitution? And that's essential for creating a nation, establishing a nation, to accept all of you to accept that within a government, you can have disagreements, but you can't stand outside of the government. Right. We all have to agree to the sort of almost like a sports metaphor that you can argue about various things within the, let's say it's a football game within the gridiron, but you have to stay within the gridiron, you know. Exactly. Those are the agreed upon parameters. Well, that idea feeds nicely into my final question, which is I always ask people, because I firmly believe, as you do, that History has to be more than just interesting stories. It actually has to tell us, speak to us now in the 21st century. So why is this well over 200-year-old story so important for 2017 and our world that we live in right now? Well, I never want to fall into the trap of history repeats itself. But I think there are so many analogies to the kinds of crisis, crises that were faced. What to do about immigrants. What party will court those immigrants? What to do about newspapers and news media? What do you sacrifice if you try to regulate them or silence them? The question of external nations 
trying to interfere with American policy. So there's a kind of way in which, not that we can sit back and say, oh, well, it's happened before, it's happening now, so we'll be fine. That's not the message. The message, I think, is, you'll forgive me, but I think the message is that these men on both sides of those issues were patriots. That is, they were deeply concerned about the health and welfare of America. And that's one of the things that I think got them all through this decade of crisis. And if we don't come to that, I think we can be severely harmed by these kinds of crises that arise in modern times. So the lesson of the 1790s is that partisanship is one thing, but it can be extremely destructive. Yeah, particularly if, it, if it's the primary motivation as opposed to the secondary motivation that country first, party second. Exactly. Has long been a tradition, certainly was a tradition in, that, in this early fragile period. And your point is well taken that, you know, the Constitution, it was not self-sustaining in the 1790s and it's not self-sustaining and self-evident in the 21st century. It's something that exactly we all, particularly our leaders, need to maintain it by, and will maintain it or, or lose it by their decisions. Exactly. I think that's well put. I, can I borrow that for, <laughs> for my book to a talk? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Borrowing. No need for a footnote. Well, Carol Birkin, this has been a joy and a lot of fun, and your book is really terrific, and I wish you the best with it, and thank you again for taking the time to talk to us at In the Past Lane. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Carol Birkin is the author of A Sovereign People, The Crises of the 1790s and the Birth of American Nationalism, just published by Basic Books and available everywhere. everyone time to close out this episode of in the past lane as always thanks for listening to learn more about the stuff we discussed in this episode just go to our show page at in the there you'll find recommended readings links and more and people please send us your comments questions and suggestions via twitter where i tweet as at in the past lane and instagram same thing in the past lane and facebook at in the past lane podcast I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, you look a little irritated. What's up? Where do I begin? SBI. Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.